Hello, everyone. Hi, we everybody. Are live, we are live on this Tuesday, April 13th, 2021. Welcome. Super excited. I'm pumped up today. I got my Becquerel U there. There's my Becquerel U shirt on. Super excited about Becquerel U in August. Justine's rocking her Becquerel sweatshirt. It is uh, actually a pretty nice Philadelphia sunny day, as you see the, uh, there it is, outside my window, the light coming in. Justine, what is it by you today? In, 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 uh, is it cold Minnesota, sunny Minnesota? What do you have? Cold Minnesota, 40 degrees, cloudy, windy, borderline, wants to snow, but oh, it's no. all good. I think last time we, we chatted, it was a beautiful Minnesota day that it was unseasonably, uh, unseasonably warm on our last YouTube live. So as you all know, we love uh, getting a sense of where you are logging in from around the country and around the world. So type in that question, uh, little YouTube chat area, where you are logging in from today. We're super excited. Uh, to what be bet school about, you're from? Yeah, what bet school you're from. We love it. We love it. I, Justine, I, I can't believe it. I was thinking the other day of what year I graduated vet school, and I was like, is it that long ago? It doesn't feel that long ago. So I'm very crazy. Fond and stressful years. memories. I know, fond and stressful memories sitting in an anatomy lab and such, but uh, really excited to have you all with here with us today. We're going to be talking about basic CPR. So we always start with basic CPR because guess what? If you don't get through the basic, you can't get through the advanced, right? So we'll have some fun. We'll have some videos, but what we're going to do is just get a couple of housekeeping things out of the way as we get things going. Those are us. That is myself and Justine. Many of you know us, so I'll go first. My name is Garrett Pachtinger. Um, I'm a critical care specialist. I uh, am just outside of the Philadelphia area, and I'm the co-founder of VetGirl along with Justine. And I am the CEO and co-founder of VetGirl. I'm an emergency critical care specialist and also a toxicologist, and I see a fellow Hokey. I went uh, to Virginia Tech for undergrad, so make sure to type in where you're coming from. Back when I graduated vet school 23 years ago, we didn't even have CPR. Just kidding. We did, <laughs> but I just had no idea what I was doing. So that's why Garrett and I are so passionate about talking about CPR today, because we're criticalists. And so we wanted to give you the updates on what's new, um, Garrett and I will sort of banter back and forth and he'll advance the slides for me. But before we begin, I'll just do a brief intro. Now, you guys should know, shameless plug, as a vet student, you're probably bombarded by all this free stuff. And we're going to tell you when it comes to graduation, as soon as you graduate, you have to pay $249 for a vet girl elite account. In Which is well worth it, by the way. Well worth of, it. Of course. But in 2021, we have over 160 hours of continuing education. It's totally Crazy. new. We have it in large animal, small animal, veterinary technician, leadership, practice management, real life rounds. We have a certificate program in basic emergency that's about 35 hours, that in advanced emergency that's 60 hours. If you're doing an internship, this is mandatory for you guys. OK, we have one in nutrition on 12 hours, thanks to generous sponsorship from Hills. And we have two really cool ones that you should watch coming in June and July. And that's going to be an anesthesia certificate and an ophthalmology certificate. So you definitely want to check those out. Becquerel Elite is totally free to veterinary military, veterinary students, veterinary faculty, and veterinary technician students. So definitely want to check that out. We also have a forum. You have a question. You can have a board certified specialist contact you um, on the forum for information. You guys already know where to follow us on social media. When in doubt, always check back at our Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube uh, because we do free events like this. Uh, so it's a great way of being able to learn. Um, we also have how to do videos. And that's the benefit of being a member, especially as a vet student, because you don't know how to do a thracosynthesis. You don't know how to unblock a cat. You don't know how to spay a big dog. You don't know how to pexy a GDV. You don't know how to pass an orogastric tube. So why not just watch the videos? So when in doubt, definitely great thing for the buck. The other thing I wanted to comment on right here is the arrow is pointing to a little box in the bottom of your YouTube screen. So if you want to make this your full screen, go ahead, click on that box. It becomes your entire screen. So it's not that small little YouTube window. Awesome. And so nice to see everyone. I'm seeing people from Tanzania. I, I climbed uh, Kilimanjaro for my honeymoon, uh, from Mexico, from the UK, from RVC. Great to see people from uh, uh, Boilermakers and a couple of gophers. So uh, just great to have everyone, have everyone on board. All right. So Garrett, why don't you go ahead and start and tell us what the Recover Initiative is? 
So excellent. So for those of you, Justine was joking when we when, when we went to veterinary school, and Justine is, is like only 30 seconds older than me, so I don't want her to smack me through the YouTube window. When we went to school, much of what we did with CPR was we sort of extrapolated from human medicine. You saw it on TV. You saw what the human physicians were doing. We said we probably should do the same. Uh, a good couple of years ago, some really, really smart people and some of our mentors, at least my mentors when I was at Penn, came together and scoured the literature for everything out there and have continued to study CPR and veterinary medicine and put, a, put together a seven-part series completely free. So even if you're not a JVEC member, it's completely free, just Google Recover, and they put together a seven-part series outlining CPR, what we know what's still anecdotal and what's out there and how we really should be practicing it. As I said before, we're gonna focus mostly on the first two bullets today because that's what we have to get through first. Most veterinary professionals don't get down to post-cardiac care. That's the intensive care unit setting when they get referred. We have to get them to the point where they're back to life and that's what we're gonna do today. So we're gonna focus on prevention, preparedness, and basic life support. Here are some straight up facts. So I'm gonna, I'll talk about why I'm gonna mention these facts in a second, but we have to recognize that CPR in general is a poor prognosis. You know, I, 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 on the website, I put together one of those AED defibrillator devices you see in any public setting like a mall in these days, but you have to recognize that CPR, our, our patients arrest different than why people arrest. It's usually not a cardiac arrhythmia, for example. It's usually these, you know, the, the 27 year old chronic renal failure, heart failure, cushionoid, uh, patient that that passes away, right? So they die for different reasons. The other thing that we have to remember is that, let's say, God forbid, there's an uh, event that happens. An ambulance, maybe it's witness, somebody starts doing compressions, the ambulance comes, there's interaction on the way to the hospital. Ugh, sometimes, I mean, I'm lucky in an urban setting if somebody gets there within 30 minutes. I mean, forget about these rural areas or suburban areas where it could take an hour or two hours to get that dog or cat from home or wherever they arrested to the hospital. They've been dead for that period of time, right? So we have to think about that. What the Recover campaign tells us is less than 5% dogs and less than 10% of cats survive something like this. Not that I enjoy an arrest in any situation, but I will tell you neonates and anesthetics are my two favorite arrests because they usually have the best prognosis. Anesthetic arrests specifically, because usually you'd like to think that if a patient was under anesthesia, they have a catheter in place so we can start either reversing drugs or giving drugs right away. They're intubated, so we're breathing for them and it's witness right away, so action is right away. But for those of you that don't do as much CPR as Justine and I do, I mean, don't ask me where to, how to do a spay, how to do a splenectomy, where to vaccinate, what preventative medicine to give, right? Ask me how to treat a SERS dog or how to do CPR, that's my wheelhouse. So when people are not in their wheelhouse, you ask me how to vaccinate, I get stressed. I'm like, I don't know, right hip, left ear, left iris, like, I don't know, stop yelling at me. Like, so I get it, CPR is stressful because you're not used to doing it. But here's a couple of pearls that I want you to remember. Pearl number one, they're already dead. It can't get worse. So you freaking out, running out of the running around the hospital, yelling at that person, forgetting where your catheters are. You don't know where your laryngoscope is because you're so stressed. You can't think about it. I know the adrenaline's up. Trust me, I get it. I'm making a little bit of a joke. I'm not just trying to get the point across that you can't make anything worse. So come, collected, take a deep breath and then get into it in the moment. After the moment, when we're done, we can review, we can talk about it, but you being frantic, running around the hospital being all crazy, it's not gonna help anyone. So deep breath, focus, get your team focused. They're looking at you. You're gonna be the leader. Get yourself focused and move on. Pearl number two, Justine, do you wanna talk about getting a code? Sure. So getting a code is really important and you have to be able to do so in a fast, efficient way. So I usually do the stoplight mentality. Red means no CPR. Yellow means I'm going to do a little bit of CPR. I'm going to do closed chest CPR. I'm going to intubate. I'm going to do positive pressure ventilation. Um, and green means full course everything. We're going to do open chest CPR. Uh, you know, we're going to be in surgery. We're going to be very aggressive. We're going to put them on a ventilator. So my one minute spiel, and I will say where I work, our front desk staff gets the code. But previously in all the other places I've worked, we did not get a code, the doctors got the code. And the benefit of having a good spiel is 
A, you have to be able to do so fast and efficiently without scaring the daylights out of the pet owner, mm -hmm. but it also reiterates to the owner how critically ill their patient is. So if Garrett was my pet owner, I'd say, hey, I do need to ask you a question just so I can respect your wishes. If Fido stops breathing or his heart stops, I just need to know what you want us to do so I can respect your wishes. I'm not saying it's gonna happen, but if it does, I need to know how invasive you want us to be. Do you want us to do CPR? Do you want us to put a tube down his airway and breathe for him? Or do you want us to be really aggressive where we'll put him on a mechanical ventilator? We'll open up his chest and do internal cardiac massage. The prognosis for um, a CPR, if your dog stops breathing, is really poor. Again, I'm not saying it's gonna happen, but I just wanna respect what you want us to do. Some people want us to go right in the middle. Obviously, we'll call you if it comes to that point. So give them a little bit of information, but don't go into like, we're gonna like open the diaphragm and we're gonna do all this. But you wanna basically phase it as, do you want us just to let him pass on his own? Or do you want us to be really aggressive and you know do open heart CPR? So again, important to reiterate, I'm not saying it's gonna happen, but just so they have a little bit of a heads up. All right, Garrett, next slide. And I love what Justine said. So what you know, what she, Justine basically said is she's not calling them the moment the dog arrests because what are they gonna do? And if you've been doing this long enough, the first thing they tell you is, can I call you back? I need to think about it or I need to call my friend. And like, so that's the last thing you want is like 10 minutes to go by as you're sitting there doing chest compressions, right? So as Justine said, the more you ask in the right way, the more comfortable you are going over this information, the more comfortable make the pet owners. And then my final pearl that I'll go into is preparation, not perspiration. So if you work in a big fancy specialty hospital or ER where you see lots of this type of stuff, you're likely going to have some sort of fancy crash cart like this that is set up. The hospital that I used to work at, we had four crash carts because it was a big, big building. So if you don't, which is fine, you don't need a, a, a $2,000 craftsman toolkit with 87,000 pieces of equipment on there. I totally get that. Then have something like a little fish tackle box that just has, it's like a to-go bag, right? So just a couple of things you need in the case of emergency so you know where everything is, but prepare. And then maybe once a month, talk to your team. If there's an arrest, this is where the tackle box sits. Somebody get the box. Everybody come to this area. That's where our sick patients go. So preparation, not perspiration. If you're prepared, you stress less. I will also say um, when it comes to preparation, I personally prefer to have someone drop two large syringes. So instead of saying, I need one cc of epi, stat. I need half a mil of atropine, stat. I need one cc of epi, stat. I need half a mil of atropine, stat. Not only are you wasting a ton of syringes and there's more needle pricks, but I'd rather just say, just draw me up 10 mils of epi, 10 mils of atropine, I dose it myself. Okay. And Garrett will pull up a CPR wheel a little bit later, but that's why we have CPR wheels. And we are giving them away to veterinary students. So if you have a vet student rep at your school, make sure to ping them for one. But when in doubt, that's part of the press, press preparation. <laughs> I like to have the two large syringes myself. Now, the next thing is prevention. The best way to not have to do CPR is to notice that your patient is critically ill to begin with, okay? So you don't wanna wait for them to respiratory arrest. You don't wanna just stand there with a tube ready as you watch your patient be dyspneic and about to respiratory arrest. You wanna be prepared, have the AMBU bag ready, have oxygen ready, have sedation necessary, have a laryngoscope ready. I'm really superstitious, so if I have a really dysmic patient, I just tape an endotracheal tube to the oxygen cage to avoid it, or I like do three Hail Marys over the patient with my <laughs> endotracheal tube. <laughs> In seriousness, the more prepared you are, the better. The next important thing is if you notice like their pupils are getting more dilated, cat's getting more bradycardic, heart rate was 200, now it's 160, half an hour later, it's 120. That patient is about to arrest. Yep. If you can't get a Doppler, 20 minutes later, you give them a fluid bowl, you still can't get a Doppler. They're starting to turn more and more pale. Don't wait for them to cardiac arrest. Intervene, fluid bolus them, assess them, check a blood pressure, check a blood glucose, check a PCV, lay your hands on that patient. So when in doubt, you always wanna prevent CPR to begin with. If you guys have any questions, please make sure to type them into the chat function so we can answer them simultaneously. All right, Garrett, take it away with chest compressions. All right, guys, so here's the deal. 
the best so you said garrett oh god are we really going to talk about chest compressions and like pushing on a dog's chest the answer is yes there's nothing i, I think that gets any more important than this because if you, no breathe no live as i was talking no heartbeat no live right so chest compressions as great as they are the best chest compressions only produce 25% of your normal cardiac output. So anything less than the best chest compression, they will just, as I put it, stay dead. So we really have to focus on give, delivering the best chest compressions. When we talk about them, there's essentially two theories, two models, the cardiac pump model and the thoracic pump model. The cardiac pump model, as cardiac sounds, the heart, is we're pushing directly over the heart itself. The thoracic pump model is used in bigger patients. We're talking about patients that are usually bigger than 30 to 40 pounds or so. If you think about a big Rottweiler, there's no way, and I did lift some of my weights today, there's no way I'm gonna push hard enough on that dog's chest, a 150 pound Rottweiler, and squeeze the chest to therefore squeeze the heart, to then squeeze the blood out, to then allow it to recoil to come back in. So I'm gonna show you, we're gonna focus on the cardiac pump model, but again, cardiac pump, you're pushing directly over the heart, which is usually the fourth to sixth intercostal space, thoracic pump, bigger dog, over the widest portion of the chest. So all the videos that I'm gonna show you now are when I was teaching one of my interns. This is a deceased dog that I had permission to train on. So in this video right here, what you're noticing is I'm in a normal table in the hospital that I used to work in. I'm six foot tall, I, uh, just about six foot. I like to call myself six foot. What you, <laughs> Justine left. What you're gonna notice though, this table doesn't go up and down. It is what it is. I'm probably taller than most of you, I would guess. I am not in an appropriate height to deliver chest compressions. I'm not. So what you're gonna notice is I'm gonna bring a stool over, a $5 little stool that sits right by that front door so I can get up and over the patient. While I am then up and over the patient, I'm gonna lock my hands and lock my elbows. So I'm using my entire upper body, not my wimpy triceps to push down on the dog. That is really very important. If you push with triceps, you will tire out very quickly. I'm keeping my arms stiff, my hands locked, and I'm using my entire upper body over the dog. That is really very important. What I also want you to notice is I want you to notice how the dog is lying down. If I go one slide further, if the dog is lying the other way, now spine away from me, if I do everything right but the spine is away from me, I'm gonna push the dog off the table. And the last thing you guys want is to have somebody whose primary job is to simply sit there and hold the dog. They have many, many more important things to do. So if the spine is against your legs, you're gonna have a much better opportunity to use your leg as a barrier so you're keeping behind, okay? So I know this is silly, but it's really important. It's a very fine point. And you think, well, why are you talking about it? Because it is important to do. Now we talk about the chest compressions themselves, but we have to talk about actually giving the chest compressions. We need to go one further. The other thing I want to talk about with chest compressions, and we'll move on to the, the combination here, is I want to talk about pressing the chest. So we talked about pushing down on the chest. What you also have to recognize is you have to let go of the chest. You have to come completely up. It's called recoil. If you don't recoil, what happens is, so again, you push down on the chest, you're pushing down on pressure. Negative pressure as you let go brings blood back to the heart. If you're a leaner, if you lean on the dog and you don't allow for complete recoil, that's not gonna allow blood to flow back to the heart. And the important thing to recognize is that as you get tired, you will do things less efficiently. You will not allow for full recoil and hence they will stay dead. So important wrap ups of chest compressions. One, at chest compressions per minute, sing staying alive in your head. I don't re really rec uh, um, um, uh, tell people to sing it out loud. It, it, it seems to uh, be a joke and, and throw some people off. So in your head, ah, 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 staying alive and Justin dances. But it makes us remember, A, okay, we're doing CPR. B, the cadence of the rhythm. And you can do this Star Wars, I think it is. Da, 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 da. I think um, uh, Baby Shark, for those that have kids, Baby 
Shark do 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 do. Hey, sing a lot of songs, right? The point being is stick on cadence, approximately 100 to 120 beats per minute. Allow for full recoil just the same, right? We can't be a leaner. Spine towards us, up above them, elbows and hands locked. The other thing that I think I have coming up, and I'm going to talk about it now anyways, I don't care how cool you think you are. It doesn't give you a badge of honor to say that you did CPR for 13 minutes by yourself. Studies will show that you should give CPR for no longer than two minutes before you rotate, if at all possible. I get it. If you're a sole practitioner, you can't, right? But if you have somebody that can swap with you, you will be much better off. The patient will receive better compressions and you will be a better compressor having time to rest and switch. If you're getting tired before two minutes, it's it's not a negative. It's not like you're less strong or have less endurance. You don't have to run a 5K. The, I will tell you, and Justine was talking about CPR, the first time I ever saw CPR, I was a third year veterinary student externing at the Animal Medical Center in New York City. It was the most brutal thing that I had ever seen at that point in my veterinary career, a third year resident giving CPR to a go big golden. The most brutal thing I ever saw. Now I understand what he was doing, but it is hard. I sweat. It is tiring to do so. So do not feel ashamed. In fact, it is the appropriate thing to switch at least every two minutes. No questions asked at all. And I'm going to pass it over to Justine that will talk about the breathing component of it. All right. So interestingly enough, part of the recover is that um, they extrapolated a lot of the evidence-based medicine to find that circulation is the most important. And I agree circulation is important. Part of that went from ABCs, airway breathing circulation, to CAB, circulation, airway breathing. And part of that is in human medicine, people don't want to put their mouth on someone else's mouth. No offense, Garrett, but like, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> He's my work husband. I not thought my we were husband. tight. So a lot of people do CAB. What about veterinary medicine? So veterinary medicine, probably still CAB, but here's my issue. I will s see people start to do CPR and they haven't even found out if the patient has a heartbeat. You actually don't do CPR or chest compressions if the patient has a heartbeat, right? Maybe they're becoming bradycardic. They're bradying down. The heart rate's 40. Mm -hmm. They need atropine. They don't need chest compressions, okay? They, If they have pulses, um, you know, I like to reach for pulses right away. I like to sculpt right away. Um, we definitely want to uh, make sure to protect their airway, but remember, it is circulation first. So do they have a heartbeat? do CPR or do chest compressions if they don't have a heartbeat as someone's getting ready to intubate them. Now, I do want to step back and just mention really quickly, the best prognosis, as Garrett mentioned, was a patient that cardiac arrest or pulmonary arrest under anesthesia. You can do CPR until you're blue in the face, but unless you reverse the drugs, you're not going to get that patient back, okay? So I always joke and say, all important drugs are usually 0.01 mg per kg. And I don't ask that you memorize a lot of drugs, but you need to know the doses of epi, you need to know the doses of atropine, which is why we created the CPR wheel. I will also say same thing with naloxone. Now, if you have a spay that's crashing, um, it underwent a cardiopulmonary arrest, I want to reverse them right away. So I always say naloxone is almost always 0.4 mg per mil, it is one mil of naloxone to a cat, dog, human heroin addict, whoever, one mil for everyone, okay? You're not gonna over reverse that patient. So I always like to, to reverse my patient. Um, if you don't have naloxone and you sedated them with something like a pure mu opioid, you can always use butorphanol. If you sedated them with a benzodiazepine, you can always use flamazenil if you have it in your clinic. And it's the same amount in mils of Valium that you drew up that you're gonna reverse them with. Same thing with dexmedetomidine, you're gonna reverse them with anesthetin or whatever you're using. Um, so my general rule is you need to know a couple of reversal doses uh, in case of emergency. So you reverse them. You check to see if they have a heartbeat. You're doing, C someone's doing compressions. They don't have an airway. It is important, in my opinion, especially with a respiratory arrest, that you make sure they're intubated 
correctly because nothing is worse than when you're doing CPR, the endotracheal tube is flying out and it turns out it was never in the airway. So it can be difficult to intubate. You wanna have a laryngoscope, a stylet, suction ready if necessary. Um, but I always say don't delay chest compressions in order to intubate, have someone start it while someone else is getting a laryngoscope. Um, I like to intubate, you have to practice intubating in a lateral. I prefer to intubate in sternal, personally, I think it's easier. But when you're on pathology and you have a patient that you just euthanized, try practicing intubation, especially on cats, because it's harder than you think. So when in doubt, the gist of CPR is the more you practice, the better you are. And while we were joking when we said they're already dead, the chances of you getting a patient back are much better the more prepared and practiced that you are, the more experienced you are. As a vet student, we're not gonna lie, you're not gonna get a lot of opportunity to do CPR while you're a vet student. But by observation, by practice on patients that are deceased or in pathology, um, being able to practice how to intubate, being able to practice where to put your hands, that is all what's gonna help you improve your survival. Garrett, go ahead. All right, excellent. So as Justine was saying, we have to make sure that, that clearly our uh, endotracheal tube is in the correct place. We have to make sure that we are intubating appropriately, which is really, really important. As she was saying, uh, you don't get the sitting sternal, head and neck extended, tongue out. I mean, the dog may be bouncing off the table if somebody gives CPR, or somebody's trying to play, place a catheter, somebody's trying to do this. If you have end tidal CO2 available, end tidal CO2 is great to hook up once they're intubated. We know that their CO2 is gonna be pretty low. It's not gonna be zero, usually in their single digits, but as they have no circulation, they're not getting rid of CO2. But if they do get back to life, it's called return of spontaneous circulation, or ROSC, your CO2 will come up. When we get them intubated, we wanna make sure that we, if they're under anesthesia, you don't just turn off the inhalant. Mo most of us use closed collection systems. You have to flush out all of the anesthetic, flush in 100% oxygen and ventilate them. Now, as Justine was jokingly saying, yes, as veterinary students, you get very little hands-on experience in some of these uh, emergent things because you're the least trained. It's just how it is, right? No one's gonna tell you to cut open the chest if you're the 10th person standing behind everybody else. But what does, and this is, this is a joke, but it is true, as a student now, as well as once you become the leader and you're gonna have somebody less qualified than you. I remember when I was a student, and it wouldn't surprise Justine to hear this, I was a type A gunner, right? I was gonna do everything better than you, faster than you, I was gonna be amazing. So if they said to Garrett, Breathe for that patient. We have them intubated. This is what I would look like. And I'm breathing like I'm, I'm squeezing that bag hard and fast, a thousand breaths per minute. Look how great I'm breathing for that patient. I'm excited about it too. I'm so excited about breathing. Here's the deal though. That is actually a very bad thing. Think about what I was talking about with chest compressions. You push on the chest, right? You hopefully push the heart and push blood out. We let the chest recoil. Blood comes back in by negative pressure, essentially, right? What am I doing when I'm breathing hard and fast for that patient? I'm giving positive pressure ventilation. I'm putting positive pressure into that chest. As a result, what I'm actually doing is I'm decreasing venous return. So if I'm, if I'm giving excessive fast breaths or excessive tidal volumes, I'm actually negating all the hard work of that chest compression person. So we want to give them, yes, 100% oxygen. We want to give them a nice Ambu bag. But when we give breaths, no more than 10 breaths per minute. When we do give a breath, we're giving a breath of a quick inspiratory time, one second, and then letting it go. We're not a prolonged, slow inspiration. Again, we don't want a lot. We, we don't want sustained positive pressure in the chest. The second thing is we don't want to give excessive tidal volumes. So a tidal volume here of 10 mils per kg. So a quick breath, fast inspiration, one second, 10 mils per kg, let it go. Chest compression, chest compression. Here. One. One. Okay, so it's not fast and hard. The faster you breathe and the harder you breathe for them, the excessive ventilation, that will make them stay dead. I know sometimes it's counterintuitive, but it's the truth. We wanna decrease the time and the duration of excessive positive pressure in the chest during CPR. And then finally, drugs. 
Justine just talked about this, right? We want to make sure that we have drugs available to, to us at all times. The two most common drugs that we think about are epinephrine and atropine. And, and as we were talking about CPR wheels, they're wonderful. You get to turn them, look at them, give you exact numbers. But essentially, right, and when you dial that CPR wheel, and I have to bring one up right now out of my little uh, bag O CPR wheel sitting next to me in our desk. Our CPR wheels are great. I have one side epinephrine, one side atropine. What you have to actually do is you dial in, say, Fluffy, he passed away, arrested, he's 27 kilograms. It gives you the exact milliliters of drug to give, no calculator required. So this low dose and high dose epinephrine, essentially this is extrapolated a little bit from human medicine. In human medicine, they found that uh, they found that uh, uh, high dose caused a concern for neurologic uh, sequela following the event itself. So we start with low dose, then we move to high dose thereafter. Justine, I'm going to pass it over to you to talk about atropine. Sounds good. All right. I have a love hate relationship with atropine. It takes forever to work, but then once it works, it's like, <laughs> so when in doubt, the one dose that I do ask that you memorize is really epi, atropine, and glucose because you don't have time to look it up. So in general, 50% dextrose is one mil per kg. We don't randomly give it during CPR because most of these patients are hyperglycemic. But if it's a young kitten, a young puppy, you can't get venous access. Um, ideally, or you don't have time to check a blood glucose, I would give dextrose in only neonates or pediatric patients. So one mil of 50% dextrose per kg. Atropine, one mil per 20 pounds. And I see that there's a lot of people from other countries. Our, um, epi, uh, our atropine is usually 0 0.54, 4 or 5 mg per mil. So in general, I usually use one cc for 20 pounds. Um, be patient with this one because once you give it, you can't take it away. And then these patients are massively tachycardic and you're using so much myocardial oxygen when the heart rate's 220, 240. Um, this is my go-to drug, especially as a vagalytic when we have patients that are bradying down. So dog is post-op, his heart rate's 60, then it's 50, then it's 40. Garrett, why are you laughing? <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing because I recognize you can you can make fun of me. I clearly put a, a bottle of ace promazine. Oh this, no. <laughs> I know. I just Don't saw that use now. Ace promazine. Don't use ace promazine. <laughs> yes. I was, I was, if, if you didn't catch me, I was gonna have people find the Easter egg of what I did wrong in the presentation for oh, a free no. swag, but all Clearly, right. it is not ace promazine. Yes. Do not use ace promazine. There's no reversal. It will make them way more hypotensive. So use atropine instead. Um, so again, great vagalit vagalytic. All right, Garrett, I'll let you go ahead in advance. I think the most important thing to keep in mind when it comes to CPR is take the time to take a deep breath. The more calm you are, the more you can run the code. And it's really good to practice. And as a vet student, I know your role is often gonna be as a scribe, but take the time to jump in and be like, hey, can I do CPR? Can I try trust compressions? They probably won't let you intubate in vet school because we wanna make sure it's spot on and fast. Um, but afterwards say, hey, do you mind if I try um, intubating this patient? Now remember, we know the average survival is typically less than 5% in veterinary medicine, but Garrett and I have both had cases that survive. And um, they are usually the post-op ones or the intra-op ones. They're usually anesthesia or sedation related. Um, you can get these guys back. But if you're not calm, you're not practiced, you're not prepared, your percentage is going to go down. Garrett, any last tips you want to conclude with? And any questions, please feel free to type them in before we jump off. Yeah, I think... <sighs> Practice makes perfect is a, a, a saying that many of us know. Perfect practice makes perfect, however you're gonna put it. I think the bottom line is the more you are comfortable with this as a procedure, the more you can guide your staff, the better you will be in an emergent situation. It's you know, it, it is in a sense like riding a bike. Like, sure, I haven't spayed a dog in almost 20 years. If I had to, I could probably do it. Would I be super darn rusty? A thousand percent, right? If I did it every day or practiced or reviewed it every week or every month, I'd be a lot better. These are clearly stressful situations. There's no way to get around it. Nobody wants this, whether it's a patient that comes off the street, so to speak, or a patient that's in your hospital that arrests. No one asks for this. No one wants it. It is not fun. Justine and I, we make jokes throughout this lecture because it, 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 
brings a little bit of a lightheartedness to a very morbid conversation, right? Nobody likes talking or doing CPR. The reality is this is incredibly important from a medical perspective. It can be truly life-saving. I mean, I don't know that anything gets more life-saving than bringing a patient back that has passed away, but I guess my takeaway would be in some ways, review this yourself, review this with your staff, preventative pre preparedness and preventative measures will go a long way when there's truly an incident. The last tip I'm gonna mention is one of the times I see it the most in the ER is when people are using propofol to sedate something for a short procedure. And I don't care what drug you use, but you better feel comfortable with it. And my little tip or my little takeaway is, when in doubt for cats, please drop propofol in one mil syringes. Because when people have three mils, they go way too fast. And when they have one mil, they draw it up way slower or they administer it way slower. There is profound apnea from propofol or alfaxalone when you use it. And I rarely use the label dose, but I see critically ill patients. Right. And I often find that I only need 0.5 mg per kg of some of these drugs. Um, so when in doubt, you always want to be prepared. If I'm blocking, unblocking a cat, if I'm putting, doing a pericardiocentesis, um, I have everything prepared. I have a gurney table with my sterile gloves, everything prepared so I can minimize my sedation, so I can maximize how fast I'm doing this um, and enhancing and getting that procedure done so I can shorten the amount of propofol or anesthetic that's necessary. So when in doubt, when it comes to um, being prepared in veterinary medicine, the more prepared you are, the more organized you are, the more things live, okay? So that's my little tip. Awesome. Well, if you guys have any questions, you know absolutely where to reach us. Uh, Justine's email as well as mine is on the screen. We certainly hope if you're a veterinary student out there, you take advantage of the complimentary Vecrol membership. It really is a great way to ASC a lot of what we have to offer, but learn a ton. There are many universities that were using our content during this past difficult year and time for their, their syllabus. So we hope you enjoy the platform. We hope you do take the time to sign up, let your friends, your colleagues, your classmates know, uh, interact with us. Like Justine was saying, we love seeing you all on social media. It's a great way to interact with us, see our upcoming events, fun stuff, get some cool swag, et cetera. But um, we thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, and I so also I added the Google form link. Um, if you're a veterinary student, unfortunately, we're only mailing these in the United States because of cost. And if your country doesn't have epi at one to 1000, the dosing is not going to be accurate. So we use one to 1000 most commonly in the United States. But in the chat, you'll see the Google form. So feel free to fill that out. Um, if you do want to get a CPR wheel, if you're not a vet student, you're more than welcome to order it directly through our website. And um, if you're interested in being a vet student rep for us for vet girl at your vet school, please reach out to us in August. We'll be open opening that up again. And just thank you for all that you guys do. I, I know vet school is really hard. Um, you guys are rocking it, even though it, everything's on Zoom. I know you guys are Zoomed out. Everyone be safe. Um, please know that we're here for you guys as a community and uh, feel free to reach out if you need anything. And stay tuned for future um, student-oriented ones. We have ones on Navli board review. We have large animal. We have poultry uh, medicine, backyard chickens. You know, so whatever you guys need, uh, always feel free to reach out. And with that, have a wonderful afternoon and thanks for all that you guys do. Bye everyone. Bye.